Hello, everyone. My name is Vidya Murthy. I uh, run operations here at MedCrypt. With me is Axel Worth. Hi, Axel Worth. I'm the Chief Security Strategist here at MedCrypt. Uh, we're excited for you all to be joining us. Not sure why this echo is happening, but OK, I think we're there. Uh, so we're going to talk today about why SBOM management is hard um, and why we still need to do it and the importance of prioritizing this as part of a security strategy. I guess my ask, if you're not talking, um, please mute yourself because we're getting a weird echo here. Uh, great. So uh, as we as we dive right into this, I mentioned it before, but please go ahead and ask any questions you have in the Q&A box or feel free to raise your hand and I will unmute you. Um, so the evolution of the SBOM in healthcare is, is one that takes a moment and that we should kind of do justice to, to talking about the background. I think um, if you think back maybe 10, 15 years, the way devices began to get connected was a little bit ad hoc. Initially, folks would bolt on a USB port for some sort of data re requirement, or they would put a, uh, an Ethernet core port in and you would somehow think, hey, connectivity is going to enhance it. And it was really kind of done in these one-off ways to try to improve clinical care. And it, and it really did, but it wasn't really evolving in a holistic way where it suddenly became, hey, everybody's using the same standard for communicating or everyone is evolving at the same time or in the same way to, to make their devices smart in some capacity. So, so you kind of had this initial jolt of let's, let's add this connectivity without, um, without kind of a, a bigger strategy and picture and certainly not with uh, security top of mind as this connectivity evolved. Um, with time though, we, we saw it become uh, more and at the same time, our, our adversaries kind of began to evolve as well. And that technology ad, uh, evolution is meant to speak to that, this notion that we have a more sophisticated community of um, potential vulnerabilities around us on both sides. So as our devices became smarter and smarter, we also had attackers who were kind of changing their methodology and changing how they would approach um, exploiting vulnerabilities in the healthcare value chain. And, and with time, we, we eventually saw the, the evolution of a regulatory perspective on this. And they started to be this expectation for, for having security be top of mind and having it be presented as part of a device's overall kind of product methodology and, and how that product kind of operates. And so we, we saw kind of these, these three parts that didn't necessarily evolve together, but have now become kind of codependent on each other. And you need some sort of synergy or, or communication between all of them to, to really be effective in maintaining a security strategy. And so in essence, what we want to talk about, right, is the SBOM is something that we really have to do because there are so many ways that it improves general security posture. I mean, to begin with, to have a really effective and proactive strategy when you're wearing your enabling security and devices, you, you need to have that level of transparency. And that transparency enables kind of both sides of the party, whether it's the device manufacturer themselves or the hospital that's actually using this device. Both parties really benefit by having that level of transparency so they can build a security posture around that. Um, and then you, you have the obvious regulatory requirements. The FDA, as well as various uh, other nations, uh, entities have, have started to request that this level of transparency be shared with them from a regulatory perspective. So to get a device into market, it's starting to kind of become the, the bar for, for requirement of security. Um, in, in recent days, I'm sure everyone here has been hearing it, but the executive order that came out kind of demonstrated this level of escalation around the importance of security and transparency, not just for kind of healthcare in isolation, but kind of in the totality of security as we think about our critical infrastructure supporting our nation. Uh, and then you, you certainly have a population as devices have become more mature, that the people buying those devices are starting to say, hey, you know, we have certain expectations when we plug this thing into our network and we want to see a certain level of security intentionality as, as we start to roll that out to, to our own ecosystem to ensure that we aren't introducing more risks or new risks into our environment. And, and that, that leads us to of how do you effectively support this request from regulators, from customers and these various stakeholders. And that, that's kind of by having this mature 
program. And to do that, you need this level of insight into the SBOM to, to really know kind of what, what it is that you're, you're trying to manage, right? And then the last point as to how helpful it is, is, is in an incident, it, it's kind of the, the starting grounds to be able to efficiently and effectively respond. One needs to have kind of that transparency into their device to, to know what the situation is that they're dealing with. But the reality is, is that th this isn't something that's easy to solve, right? We have to be realistic about kind of what these requirements are and making sure that by understanding kind of the challenges in place, we, we can overcome those and come up with strategies and approaches to, to really make it effective. So we, we kind of broke out the it's hard into two phases. You have kind of this pre-market. So before your device gets into uh, gets into live mode, what do you need to demonstrate in order to be effective? And then there's a, a second set of challenges that focus on post-market that also uh, must be managed in a very different process, really, from from kind of how you deal with it before uh, it gets to market. And that's kind of what the, the next bit of the presentation is. So we're, we're gonna delve into what the pre-market requirements are next. Okay, thank you, uh, Vidya. As um, you already indicating, um, you know, there, there is a difference between the use of, of SBOM as, as a security process tool in the pre-market and the post-market scenario. And I just wanna walk you through um, the, the the two use cases here, uh, pre-market being the first one, where it's it's obviously about generating an S bomb uh, to begin with, and then uh, also the ability to extract all S bomb components sufficiently deep across your entire supply chain, um, then uniquely identify the S bomb components, uh, make sure that they all have a unique name, that you don't have any duplicates, that you don't miss any any um, components of your software or misname them and so forth. Um, then of course comes the, the heavy lifting and that is that all those individually identified components need to be matched against published vulnerabilities um, as, as they are available through uh, vulnerability databases. Uh, that then leads to um, a risk assessment and the mitigation of vulnerabilities Again, we're still talking pre-market here. Uh, and then in, in a more stable state, the management um, of the SBOM per product version. Uh, unfortunately, products are not stable, software changes, and each version has their own SBOM that needs to be then maintained independently. Next slide, please. Uh, so if you map this out now as a you know, flowchart, um, obviously, again, you start with extracting your SBOM. Uh, you resolve any naming false positives or false negatives you may have, uh, because unfortunately, software component naming is not standardized and there will be ambiguity that needs to be addressed. Um, then you match your um, software components against known and published vulnerabilities, and then you uh, engage in the mitigation process which may result uh, in an iterative approach uh, because you have to go back and update your SBOM. Um, you may work with your supply chain, you may work with your engineering group in order to address the identify risks. And then eventually um, you have a release candidate that then is slated for uh, regulatory filing and approval and eventually um, will end up with a customer, not only as a product, but also with the product supporting information which which includes among other things um the s bomb i think that's pretty much an expectation in this day and age both um established through regulators but also through uh, customer purchasing contracts and others uh, next please so the the key here is, is really what is in that in that red box right that's that's the heavy lifting and that is the challenge to be able to uniquely identify your software components, and then correctly match them against vulnerabilities. Now, admittedly, there's some simplicity in this diagram. The reality is, is more complex. Um, but this, I think, gets the essence across, uh, including, again, what, you know, what are the most challenging parts of this process. Uh, next slide, please. Um, now, post-market uh, is a slightly different use case, obviously, 
the expectation is that the manufacturer of a device publishes the SBOM or shares the SBOM with their customers and, and also with regulators as part of their regulatory filing um, and then engages in con continual management and communication around, for example, changes to the software, newly discovered vulnerabilities, uh, advisory on, on mitigations and so forth. Um, the key then is on uh, on the HDO side to identify the correct uh, devices that match that version of an S-bomb. Uh, so if you take the scenario of a newly discovered vulnerability, challenge one is for the manufacturer to correctly identify the software versions affected by this vulnerability and communicate that to the customer who has then still to identify the individual physical devices that are called out in this specific mitigation. Uh, so there's clearly a challenge there to uh, connect different databases and different systems uh, in an efficient way and certainly correct so that, that these devices can be identified. Um, the, the risk can be assessed specific to those devices and then obviously it can be mitigated and ideally also tracked and reported back to the manufacturer that the issue has been resolved. Next slide, please. Again, mapping out the process flow here, and, and you know, we take a hypothetical example. Uh, we call it WannaCry 2.0. Right? Um, so take a scenario where a new vulnerability has been uncovered, where a new piece of malware is known to exploit a certain vulnerability that affects your medical devices. Right? How do you respond to that? Um, you have the S bombs for your devices and your device versions, and you, you have the uh, information about the vulnerability. You need to match those so you identify which device and version uh, is actually affected by this particular example, by this um, uh, action, then assess whether that particular vulnerability in this given implementation, in this given design, and in this given use case is actually exploitable. Uh, and if, if the judgment is that it is, then you communicate to your customer who then has to identify the specific assets, apply the mitigation, potentially communicate back, um, and therefore in the end, uh, reduce risk. And the, the challenge here, and again, this is a somewhat simplified diagram you know, for purpose of this presentation here, but the challenge really is uh, the complexity here right? between the number of devices an MDM, a medical device manufacturer needs to maintain and the number of individual versions, their software components and the assessments of, of the exploitability of that given vulnerability within each version of the device um, is the complexity challenge on the manufacturer side. On the HDO side, um, the challenge is then to identify the right version of the affected devices um, if you have one or two MRI scanners and you get information about a vulnerability there, that is, you know, a fairly easy solution because uh, A, you only have few and B, MRI scanners usually don't move around. But if you have a few thousand infusion pumps, you need to manage, it becomes a much more complex problem to solve, um, starting with the, the ability to identify the correct version of the assets that are, that are impacted by this particular vulnerability. Uh, next slide, please. So then we asked ourselves, kind of how do we bucket the things that that make this hard? And the, the kind of natural breakout that came from that were there are some things that are kind of systemically felt across the board, and then there are some that are a bit more idiosyncratic uh, in terms of nature. So taking a look at kind of the first pass of what are systemic challenges during the implementation of this, the first one is, is really tooling, right? If we think of the tools that exist, a lot of the uh, challenge can become the misalignment of what the tool is intended to do and trying to apply it in the use case of supporting kind of the whole vulnerability life cycle. So a lot of tools tend to be focused on either one subset or one portion of the process, but they don't necessarily help guide kind of going across the board, as well as once the device is, is kind of post-market, a lot of the, um, the generation tools or the tracking as part of 
natural development uh, process don't really support kind of ongoing maintenance of managing these vulnerabilities. And that, that, that's something that can create a little bit of friction across the board. And the next one is the depth of components. So when we think about a software bill of materials, the question really becomes kind of how, how far do we go? Do we, when do we terminate trying to track the, the level of granularity within an SBOM. And I don't know that as an industry, we, we've really landed on one answer that everybody agrees to, but it's certainly something that everybody acknowledges as a challenge and, and is something that I think we, we have to kind of come to alignment on as we, as we think about how do we maintain this going forward. The third one is one uh, anyone who's tried to match a uh, known vulnerability to an SBOM component can attest to how challenging this is. The, the naming convention can prove very challenging, whether somebody uses a hyphen, whether they use a space, whether there's uh, a numbering scheme that's slightly different. It can be very difficult to, to kind of be able to match things in a straightforward way. And, and some level of kind of fuzzy matching tends to evolve as, as folks try to build out a solution to this. Uh, and then the, the fourth one I would think is part of the implementation has to kind of do with this dependency or hierarchy that exists within SBOM. So um, the way software is built is not, it's not easy, right? It's a very complicated thing to, to make work. So you have a level of um, that complexity that gets reflected in the SBOM. So you have to really think about how uh, these dependencies are reflected as you start to try to track what is inside a, a device. I think the second half of this has to do with once you're actually trying to implement this program. So devices, just like any other software, are constantly undergoing some level of change management. So making sure that versioning of devices, versioning of um, builds are really tracked in a way that is sustainable and scalable as uh, as these vulnerabilities start to uh, want to be managed is, is a challenge and not necessarily something that uh, a standard kind of development process is accommodating. The next is kind of use cases. So there can often be times where a component, the way it's been implemented in a device cannot be exploited as part of uh, what has been identified in a known vulnerability. But how does one reflect that in their SBOM so that everybody knows it? Is it going to be that you have to pull together the person who built the device, the person who identified the vulnerability and somebody on the, the use case side to actually come to that conclusion? Or is there some way that we can start to kind of track that and come up with a, a universally understood so that we're, we're consistent about it and can rapidly determine whether we are impacted or not? The scalability is, is exactly what Axel was alluding to, right? This isn't a one device to one hospital scenario. It's kind of a many to many relationship. And you really have the variability of devices and versions that the device manufacturer is tracking. And then you have a whole different scenario potentially where the device is operating, like has a patch been applied? Which version is the device on? Being able to ensure that alignment is is a substantial challenge when you think about kind of the, the math alone of, of the magnitude of the problem that we're, we're trying to solve with. And the fourth one is a, a lot of folks question, right? What is the what is the SBOM giving us at the end of the day? And we, we really have to become consistent in how we demonstrate the ROI because everyone agrees, I'd imagine, um, on this call as well as for sure in our organization that, that there is value in the SBOM. It does change a security program. It can enhance the security posture of the device, the patient, and the hospital kind of pretty consistently. But how does one demonstrate that? And if we if we could come up with language that we all kind of agree to and how we measured it or KPIs or something, I think that could go a long way to broadening the adoption of this notion uh, across the board. So that brings us to the, the other kind of bucket of challenges that we face. And those are what I would call kind of idiosyncratic. So this is that, that variability based on experience. So um, from a regulator perspective, th there's kind of this challenge now where um, if as a device manufacturer, you're advocating for putting uh, an SBOM out there and sharing and being transparent, and then sometimes the regulator asks for it and sometimes they don't. And I think having that kind of one-off person depending uh, on their enforcement of the guidance can become a little bit of a challenge for folks to know how to navigate. And you, you really end up in a situation potentially where you've advocated for, for something to be implemented in a device and then the question doesn't get asked. So it's hard to demonstrate that it, that it really needed to be invested in. The next one has to do with um, the device purchaser. So 
the, the maturity of hospitals kind of varies uh, depending on some that have kind of their own pen testing teams and they're able to do a very robust security review of devices. And then you kind of have other hospitals that, that kind of procure what is at the right price point and meets the right clinical requirement and security isn't really top of mind for them. So how as a device manufacturer, do you manage those kind of varying expectations? Do you go to the least common denominator or do you try to accommodate what is the uh, most robust security posture uh, or that the guidance is asking for. And then the third idiosyncratic thing is kind of per device manufacturer. So the uh, the maturity within organizations that are developing devices can, can vary widely, right? And some devices have um, had a thought around security since the very first USB port was was put in. Um, and, and some have, have had a harder time kind of advocating for security to be adopted. The, the variability within organizations is certainly something that, that can become challenging, not just for the organization to then deal with, but anybody on the other side from a stakeholder perspective. If you have a regulator or a hospital that's buying to, to get kind of different answers from different parts of the organization is, is something that, that can prove challenging for, for folks to manage. So, so the question is now, um, starting to wrap up here, you know, why, why should we focus on s -bomb? And why should we do it now? I think the first part of the question, uh, you know, we have answered, but just to recap a couple of um, key points here and, and especially address the why now aspect. Um, you know, we already talked about this, this WannaCry 2.0 scenario, but the ability to identify um, the right devices and device versions, triage and make the decisions around the impact of that vulnerability then develop and, and distribute the mitigation and potentially <clears throat> recover from any incidents that may be related uh, to this particular vulnerability is, is a set of challenges. Um, this may be easier if it is a vulnerability that is uh, happening at the level of the operating system, right? If you have a vulnerability that affects a known version of your operating system, you can probably identify the effect that device versions that run that OS version pretty quickly. But if you think back of, about some of the more per pervasive vulnerabilities, um, you know, things like uh, Urchin 11 and Ripple 20 and Amnesia 33, those were all deeply embedded several layers down and were not necessarily and, and easily identifiable plainly by the version of the operating system, right? They, they required deeper knowledge of the device to find out whether that particular network stack or other third-party component um, of the affected version was actually in your product. And I think that makes um, certainly SPOM analysis challenging at times. Um, second is obviously um, to provide consistency from pre-market and, and initial inception of a new idea of a product um, all the way to end of life and end of support by the manufacturer and even past that many times, uh, the decommissioning and end of life at the uh, health organization, right? You need to provide consistent security management across the entire life cycle and provide consistent security decisions um, that help you to maintain the device's security posture. And that is not only true for one device, but true for the sum of all devices that operate on, on a given network. Uh, obviously, anything we do in security should not impede on clinical innovation but it should not impact the functionality the utility the usability um you know whatever of the device right the device needs to be secure without impact on its clinical purpose and without stifling clinical innovation and and for example stopping new life-saving uh, technologies from entering the market and you know, therefore, we, we think S bomb is a is a good way of addressing that required continuity in innovation um, and implementing security without being uh, disruptive. Um, then, lastly, obviously, managing stakeholder expectations, right? and that goes all the way to the highest level of the government with the, with the most recent executive order that uh, um, President Biden issued, which calls out S bomb. Um, regulators around the globe, uh, doesn't matter whether you look at the FDA um, or other international regulators, call out SBOM 
as a critical tool. And that is not, not only true in healthcare, it is true across many other industries as well. We also see that more and more hospitals are including um, requirements around security documentation, including SBOM, in their purchasing process and in their contracts and impose them as procedural security requirements on their suppliers, on the vendors. And then lastly, it's a matter of public awareness. Right? Uh, over the last couple of years, through some of the um, you know, headline driving security events we have all witnessed, um, the general public is much more aware not only of the individual event, but also of the risk of um, security incidents on our personal lives, on our economies, on our societies. Uh, so clearly that public awareness drives the users of devices, the hospitals, as well as the manufacturers of devices to be more conscious about uh, how they make decisions with regards to security. Uh, next slide, please. So how much security is enough security? And that is a very difficult um, question to answer. And um, right, I mean, it is not just the security of your design. It is also the maturity of your response to, for example, um, <clears throat> new security incidents or newly disclosed vulnerabilities. And that I think distinguishes um, manufacturers that take cybersecurity serious from others that are still trying to find their way and identify how they should address it. But it's that maturity in being able to deal with it. And that maturity does include everything we talked about with regards to the SBOM, the visibility, the, the reliability, um, the granularity, and so forth. Um, and that needs to be applied against the entire device lifecycle. Uh, from inception to end of life. And you need to be able to demonstrate measurable um, progress. You as an organization have a certain level of security. Uh, you have a certain level of maturity, but you also need to recognize that going forward, as attackers become more sophisticated, become more targeted, you as an organization will continue to make progress and continue to mature. Uh, next slide, please. So um, starting to wrap up here, uh, a good SBOM program, I think, covers both the pre-market and the post-market requirements. Right? In the pre-market space, it is about the depth of your analysis. Do you get sufficiently deep in identifying your software components? Um, are you able to uniquely identify the individual components? Um, can you track not only component versions, but also device versions? And then can you match those versions correctly against published vulnerabilities and track that going forward um, as your device enters the maintenance cycle? Um, are you able to properly score risks in the context of the specific design and in the context of the device's use case and then respond with mitigation um, and do that in a changing world of software. But software is never stable, and therefore, um, whatever process, whatever tool you apply, needs to be able to keep up with the change and needs to be able to lead to proper proper resolution of any uh, vulnerability and, and, and incidents that, that you are fa facing. And then in, in the post-market, it comes down to awareness. What can you recognize that was that that one cry to the door example, uh, can you recognize if a particular vulnerability actually impacts um, your particular device version and point your customers to the correct version that needs to be uh, mitigated. The, the process of matching and tracking, identifying the assets, manage their risks, um, then continually manage the change, right? Because guess what, after the mitigation, after the update, after the patch is deployed, your device is of a different, different version. Um, continued communication, not only to your customers, potentially also to regulators. Um, the distribution of information, the distribution of software updates, 
that are part of the mitigation and in the end then closure of the process and the ability to um, to state yes we have successfully um, managed the process and we have driven this process to resolution and the ability to do that reliably and repeatedly uh, next slide please um, here are a couple of, of uh, resources there's a, a very valuable initiative uh, going on under the um, uh, NTI umbrella, the uh, SBOM initiative. Uh, here's the URL if you are interested. Uh, several working groups and work streams uh, trying to deal with not only the the abstract and theoretical background of the SBOM problem, but also running actual um, uh, trials on manufacturers extracting SBOMs and sharing those with um, with HDOs to identify from a process perspective and from an interfacing and integration perspective, what needs to be in place for this to work. Um, at the upcoming Biohacking Village um, in, in August, uh, there is also uh, an offer from, from us, from Metcrip, uh, to use one of our tools to extract an SBOM from the devices uh, that are participating in the Biohacking Village. And then the last resource here is uh, actually uh, your ability to to ask for free free trial uh, of our Heimdall tool, which is again uh, the, the tool behind our approach to SBOM extraction and vulnerability management. And with that, I'll hand back to Vidya to wrap up. Great, thanks, Axel. Um, we would love questions. If folks have them, feel free to type them in or raise your hand, uh, and I can unmute you. Um, or feel free to drop us a note if you uh, want to take this offline and chat further. Um, while that kind of gets assembled, I would also like to put out there that as part of MedISO, we want to start holding kind of general office hours to, to drop in and ask us questions about the SBOM or anything else to do with device security that you may have. And uh, we can see if we can start helping folks out. We'll post this on the uh, website as well, so you uh, you don't need to write down the URL. But I will uh, certainly uh, look forward to to folks continuing to join us in the conversation and kind of the the progress that we're we're hoping to make. Okay, well, feel free to ask us questions offline. I, uh, I appreciate everyone taking the time to join us today. And, uh, oh, there's a, the light went on, great. Thank you for, okay, one question. Oh, we're waiting, no problem. <laughs> Sorry, that's on me. I, I didn't give enough time, I'll give more time, no problem. <laughs> How does Heimdall support processes? An excellent question. Actually, you want to take that one? Yeah, so I think the, the, the key here is that we have designed the product um, yeah, around both the, 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 the pre and post market processes, um, and especially the, the post market scenario where um, you know, we provide, for example, the ability. Um, of matching of vulnerabilities back to the individual software component so that you can, you know, once you have loaded <clears throat> and, and Im imported uh, all your SBOM components uh, in, in the tool across all your products and product versions, uh, we can actually go in and, and look for specific vulnerabilities within the software components and identify the device versions affected. So basically, do reverse lookup. Um, so rather than go from S1 component to vulnerability, we can go then in the post market scenario, go in with the vulnerability and identify the affected component, component version, and product version. That answers the question. Uh, from a, yeah, from a quality process perspective, 
Um, I mean, it is clear that, that regulators are asking um, manufacturers to do a better job on, on including cybersecurity in their overall uh, quality frameworks. Right? And, and since uh, cybersecurity is part of, of patient safety, um, this is you know, driven not only by the FDA, but also many other international regulators um, you know, across the globe. And, and having proper software management, software component management, and vulnerability management, um, you know, is and should be part of, of the overall security processes as they relate to, to the quality framework. I think Hans had a follow-up there is a direct link to security issues dealing with assets inside the device. I think if I understand that correctly, that's um, are we able to tie a vulnerability to the asset? Is that I think that that's where we're going with that. And I think um, if if the entire MedCrypt platform is used, in fact, we we can tie it down to imagine like a serial number level. So then, if a particular vulnerability comes up, you can go into the portal, say, "Hey, this is the issue that we're dealing with." It'll check the assets from a naming convention and see if one of the SBOM versions has that issue. And then, if you're running kind of the total MedCrypt platform, then other facets called Guardian are able to tie that into a specific device serial level number and you can then identify which asset that is and then alert the relevant healthcare provider that asset xyz is is experiencing this vulnerability go ahead and patch it or whatever the mitigation may be thank you for the question i appreciate it any other questions from anybody I recognize a lot of names on the list here, and, and uh, some people are unusually quiet, so please, please feel free. Okay, well, if there are no more questions, then uh, thank everybody for attending. Um, you have our contact information. Um, if you have any additional questions, feel free to reach out to us. Thanks, everyone. Thank